Data can tell some, some, some very interesting stories, and some of these can be picture stories, but even otherwise, data is a very interesting thing. And partly I want to share some examples of what can be done with data. And this talk is more about just expanding your mind, hoping to show you some new things, hoping to tell you some interesting stories that just come up purely in your practice. And what I will not be doing is talking about any of the techniques that are going on behind this. There are at least a couple of talks going forward that will be talking about how one can do things like this. This is just about examples of what can be done. Uh, the picture that you see here is a map of the flights in the United States. I'm sure some of you have seen this before. And if you, if you saw this in an animation, uh, you would have seen that the flights start from Europe, land into the country, while the rest of the country is dark as when it wakes up. And then the local flights start, like move, and then eventually there are flights on the Pacific coast, the East Coast starts sleeping at that time. And this visualization, this, this animated visualization, this video, is something that was made entirely using animals. The only source of every dot on this image was the flight position at a given point in time. Nothing else. Let me introduce myself. My name is Anand. I am a data scientist at Grammar Hotel. We will do some data visualization. Some of what I'll be showing you is our work, some of it is public work. And we'll be talking about some examples of pictures, the origin of Possibly the earliest example of this would have been Florence Nightingale's visualization. When in the, during the Hundred Years' War, she looked at the number of people that were dying because of illnesses which she depicted in blue versus the number of people that were dying because of the war injuries either directly or indirectly. You can see the story that it tells. And this was her requisition to Queen Elizabeth saying we need more hospital facilities. She got it. And this is going to be one of the contributing factors for England being Queen back then. Uh, John Snow uh, in <coughs> sometime around the same time prepared this visualization to show where cholera hits. At that time it was not known that cholera is one, <laughs> and he <coughs> plotted the spots where families were, in, were affected and the pump that they were drawing water from and found a very strong relation. That established uh, quite clearly that water was the source of the disease and ended up saving several lives. Now, this was centuries ago and if they could visualize data then this effectively we with computers ought to be able to do better. And to be fair, we are doing better. We are actually doing quite an amazing job. This, for instance, is a visualization of London. Every single dot here is drawn in an automated way. The red dots are places where people have taken photos and posted it on Flickr. The blue are dots where the tweets are in town. And you can immediately see a pattern. You can see that there are the business districts which are somewhat bluish. There are the tourist spots which are reddish. You can see that, uh, there's uh, working on virus. There's that's a lot of London. Uh, and you can see Oxford Street emerging. You can see the structure of the streets. And all of this is without overlaying any real data, any map based data. This is purely through Flickr and Twitter. Uh, but the question is why visualize that part's being cut off, unfortunately. But visualize for a minute that this says why you're <laughs> Well, there are some things that visualization can tell you that you cannot see very immediately with the data. For example, uh, if you take a look at this data set, it shows you for different cities over a year the price and sales of a product. And our first guess would be well, the average prices look the same. Nine, 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 nine. The average <coughs> sales looks the same, it's all seven point five. The average variance is consistently 10 uh, for the price, and the average variance for sales is 3.75. Uh, looking at the numbers, I can't quite tell much. I mean, maybe I can figure out some pattern. It'll take me a while. Let's just plot it. But first thing, first thing I want to highlight is that this data set looks like the four cities are completely identical. They're not. Bangalore. Slightly positive correlation. So as you increase the price, the sales seems to increase. 
daily increases up to a point, it then stops. Hyderabad looks like there's a near perfect correlation, but there's an aberration. That might have been an error in the data. And Mumbai, we never bothered changing the price except on one occasion that we did. It moved, but I would argue that there's not enough uh, <coughs> data to prove the point. Now, it's the same data set. The conclusion that we're drawing from the picture is extremely different from the conclusion that we're drawing from the summarized statistics, from looking at the numbers themselves. And there's, again, to repeat, one thing that I want you to take away is when we get a data set, a data set plot it, just plot it. Whatever way you can, whatever tool you have, Excel, paper, pencil, whatever you plot it, you are bound to get something that is different and more insightful than if you were to just look at the table of numbers. Uh, we were working with an energy utility who said, look, we have a strong problem. We know that meter readings are being taken, but not quite accurately. In some cases, it's solution to the customer, in some cases, it's not. And we have this ton of data under the it's worth of it, which we can't process. We don't know. We, don't, we have neither the technology nor the analytic expertise. See whether there's a pattern of fraud there. So we did what I just suggested. Let's just simply plot it. Nothing sophisticated. Let's see how many people have a meter reading of 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So this is one year's worth of data for a state. And what that looks like is this. You know, roughly like a normal curve. Long normal actually. But there are a few spikes. The biggest spikes are at 50, 100, 150, 200 degrees that we are here. And those, incidentally, are exactly the slab boundaries. The person with a meter reading of 150 pays, uh, so a meter reading of 100 pays slightly less than a person with a meter reading of 101. That's where the spikes are. What surprised us though is uh, the spikes at 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on. There's no economic reason for that. Or, the unit rate is the same. So if you had a meter rate of 11 versus 10, big deal. It's just one point. So why were these happening? We weren't sure. So then the uh, commissioner looked at it and said, okay, this supports the other uh, thought that we had, which is these are not meter readings that were taken and then adjusted. These are meter readings that were never taken in the first place. The guy just puts in a wrong number. So not only really do we have a, and they were trying to automate the readings and what they made some a, a, a case to prove to the unions that there is a reason for automating it. And this was strengthening their case. But then a second look at the data showed us uh, a few other things. Because now, sure, people are trying to reduce that meter reading, but is this happening uniformly? Meaning, is it more like, you know, guy comes, I pay him a certain sum of money, and he reduces the meter reading? Or is it more like a fixed formula? You know, on a regular basis, you keep my meter reading down. Is it the same set of people for whom the meter reading are coming down, or, or getting to the uh, boundaries? Or is it a you know, very diverse set of people? So, uh, while you probably are not able to see it very clearly, uh, each row shows the meter reading of an individual over the course of a year. And the lady who's in the first row had a meter reading of 200, 200, 200, 200, 200. And that's tough to find. It's a case of broken meter. Except for this uh, three day period. So, this gentleman looked at the name and said, oh, okay, I know what happened to that three day Apparently, there was a huge marriage at their uh, place. And, uh, his guess is the actual reading would have been 5,000. So the diamond would have gone to them and said, uh, and said okay, please, can I put you in my schedule or something like that. Uh, but it also varies by geography. So for instance, if you take different sections of the city, the degree of fraud, which can characterize as the percentage bump at the uh, slab boundaries, varies anywhere from, for instance, in section 1, it's 70% going all the way up to 136%, which means that there are about close to 1.36 times as many people with a meter rating of 100 as compared to 90. <coughs> Huge jump. So, uh, so that section's got far bit of fraud happening. And as you go further down, the degree of fraud keeps decreasing. You can't see the bottom of the section. The bottom was something like 30% fraud, which is good. I guess one has to do with some degree of problem. Uh, but here there's uh, an interesting anomaly that there was a big dip here, mm -hmm. and then almost as if to compensate, this moved up. And mm -hmm. checking back to the records, looks like that's the time when the section manager moved in there and moved back, moved out of that section. So, yes, the data is people dependent, but uh, in some cases, it can also show you the people that are hitting some of the data. Uh, we were working with the Tamil Nadu uh, Education Department. Trying to see if there was a story around what credit smarts. So, given a child, can we find out 
upfront what marks are they likely to get purely based on demographic. So does gender make a difference? Does South uh, community that Tom make a difference? Does the choice of subject make a difference? And you'd be surprised to find that uh, <laughs> the choice of subject actually makes a massive difference. I'll come to that. Uh, but uh, we are also testing some weird things like uh, does astrology have any significance? Does numerology have significance? You know, do people born in certain months uh, score better marks? Do people with different first letter of the game have different marks? And so on. Now, people with different first letters, uh, there is no statistically significant difference. If you're interested in 2011, the letter T scored the highest mark. <laughs> <laughs> the letter W scored the lowest, but not uh, statistically significant, not very significant. Sun sign makes a huge difference. Huge. 12 percentage point difference. Statistical significance, P is less than 10 to the minus 20, which means the probability that I'm wrong is less than 0.0000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
it comes to 70 pages. You're not going to be able to pass 70 pages in one shot. Part of what data visualization does is compresses information into a very compact representation, and that's the value. That's all <coughs> that. Oh, sorry. Uh, the other thing I missed out was we did the same thing for uh, the world we can see in the top 100 computers. Again, I'm not sure if you're able to see the colors that well, but the fastest uh, scoring batsman in the range flashes by a huge margin is Shahid Afi. 119th strike rate by the second highest value across this hundred. Uh, interestingly, there's also uh, an increase in the strike rate over time. So if you look at a person like Kapil Dev, who batted more than a decade ago, uh, he was batting at a time when the average strike rate per year was less by about three, three percentage points. So which means so less every decade by about three percentage points. If you make that adjustment, Kapil Dev's strike rate compares to that of say. So in his time, he was not as fast a batsman as Seva was. Uh, what can we make out of security spicing information that we get? Can we see any pattern of location? If I'm holding a given security or a set of securities, uh, are there any specific security that I should be holding more of to de risk it? Should I be holding less of some of those because they don't similarly what I've got? Right. Here's a picture that shows the correlation between a set of currencies. Commodities like gold, silver, and stock indices, FTSE, S and P, and so on. Each square shows you the numerical correlation. So the Australian dollar versus the euro was for the six-month period ending December uh, 2011 uh, is about 68 percent. And the badly visible thing there, unfortunately, is the scatter plot. Now remember what I said earlier: in general, always plot. So a number can smoothen many things. The reason for this was, for instance, the Singapore dollar was uh, correlated against a British currency, but it, was, it had a nearly zero correlation. And there are two reasons why you have a nearly zero correlation. Either for the first three months you had a positive correlation and then a negative correlation, and therefore it's averaging out to zero, or because there really is no correlation. And for Singapore dollar versus that conceiving crash was a form that there was a strong positive correlation initially and then a strong negative correlation later on, which is very different from uh, zero or uh, something close to zero that you find here, for instance, between uh, the Malaysian limit and what was but uh, what you also see is there are certain, certain blocks of related currency, like Singapore dollar, dollar, Japanese yen, gold, uh, Swiss franc, and the Chinese yuan, who tend to move with each other almost perfect, perfect units. And uh, there are uh, there's another block of currencies here, uh, the SNP, the FTC, and the BSC, which also moves with each other. And for some reason, with Pakistan, it be also reasonably correlated with that. But these two blocks move countercyclically with each other. So if any of these East Asian currencies plus gold and the Swiss franc goes up, <coughs> this block goes down and vice versa. So if you held gold and wanted a decent hedge against it, the most negatively correlated against that would be the FTSE. So hold the British index, that's your best hedge against gold. If you hold the FTSE, then your best hedge against that. Uh, if you hold the FTSE, your best hedge is gold. And if you hold the Indian rupee, then your possible best hedge against that would be the Japanese yen. But it's not strong enough. Minus red seven. It's still not good. Uh, before I go on into this one, which has just been talking for maybe 15 minutes. In. <coughs> okay, just keep going on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Stop me anytime you got any of those. In fact, I'll try and wrap this up in five minutes. Another thing we were trying to do was uh, take, uh, sort of like uh, Arun Kaufman's visualization of flights in the US, can we take weather data and uh, plot it? So, uh, <clears throat> if we, we took the last 100 years worth of uh, weather data for each uh, district and plotted that on a video. And first, we tried to see whether the temperature across the century varied a lot. Now, unfortunately, the color combination isn't looking. So you just have to see it on our website. Uh, but each row is showing you India's weather by district by month. So January, February, March, April, and so on. And that's it, that's each column. And each row is showing you by decade. So 1919, 10, 1920, and so on. Uh, what you'll see in the full color version of it is that there really isn't much of a difference between January. 2001 versus January 2001. 
whereas there is a huge difference between January 1901 versus May 1901. But also, if you play it like a video, there's some patterns that emerge. So, for instance, the Northeast uh, and Jammu and Kashmir are fairly cool throughout the year. So is the West Coast, basically. The Southwest Coast and Malabar Coast is consistently cool throughout the year. But what was most interesting was that there were two places in India, two districts, which have a complex cyclical pattern. You have these areas being cool when the surrounding areas are hot, and these areas hot when the surrounding areas are cool. Which, you, as you play the video, will come to your obviously that. Not to play the video just now. Uh, <coughs> one is Bilaspur and Chhattisgarh, and the other is Shimoga. So one common thing we could find was both are valleys. So perhaps that's the significance. We don't know. Now the thing about some of these visualizations is they can tell you what's happening. Not necessarily why. The last application, even deeper with more data. Let me skip the dashboard section. About uh, <coughs> something that we did with uh, Triple ID. <coughs> we were playing with uh, their computer users. So for a period of 40 days, every single activity of uh, every single student would record. When I say every single activity, I mean write down from every keystroke that they type, which applications they were using, and so forth. So it therefore means that I have the Gmail password of a feast of the students. <laughs> and they, they were told, by the way, that they have the option of turning it off. They didn't. Anyway, <laughs> so each column is a student, and each row is an application that they were using. The color indicates the degree to which they were using it. So the browser, uh, Firefox was the most used. Microsoft Word on which they were doing assignments was the second most used. Chrome was the next most popular browser. And you cannot see clearly who's using Firefox versus who's using Chrome. And Internet Explorer is there as well, somewhere. Some people really do use Internet Explorer. <laughs> <laughs> and we have some strong doubts on why they're using Internet Explorer. <laughs> uh, this might explain. The fifth most used application was VLC. And, uh, they did have course videos actually. <laughs> but uh, you could see the titles of uh, the, uh, the content they were watching. And uh, one good thing came out of it. We have a solid movie recommendation list. <laughs> also, uh, this. The width of each of these is the amount of time that they're spending on the computer. So the people out here are spending that much time, out here are spending that bit of time. And the person here, and the first, the two top users, uh, between them, uh, they are among the few people using Half-Life. There are only four people playing Half-Life. As opposed to, for example, Notepad, which is used by practically command processor, which is used by practically But just these four people have managed to push Half-Life the top half of the list of applications and spending 10% and 11% of their time on this. This guy is a solid dream. Going to walk around 8% of their time. <laughs> yes, he or she uh, gets their time. Uh, what this tells you is partly who's using what, how, but it can also go a step further than that. What we haven't done yet, but are the process of doing is trying to see how they switch between applications. So when I'm using, for instance, my editor, do I immediately switch to the browser, or do I then switch to my SQL, which will be and use uh, you know, a, a video of why I'm learning, what are the patterns of learning, how long does it take? The other thing that we're exploring is, how long are they spending on a video? Is a video of five minutes too short? Is a video of one hour too long? How, you know, people would pause it, when they <coughs> pause it. That's another kind of behavior inside that you find it all. When I was uh, relocating back from the UK, one of the things I was trying to decide on was which city to settle in. Uh, and when I was here in August, so I caught up with uh, Paige, he interviews with a bunch of people, who interviews with a bunch of people, and Bangalore was a very quick link to a bunch of things. Tried to save in Chennai, on one chat, independently from another chat, independently from another chat. So I just talked there, I could find people. Then, you know, uh, tried the same thing in Hyderabad, couldn't find anyone. <laughs> So I said, let's, let's take GitHub. For those who are not aware, GitHub is sort of like Facebook for uh, kids. <laughs> and I uh, said, let's draw a line between who is following each other. We figured uh, this network by who's living in the city. And let's uh, draw the vision and see what the pattern is in the city. And again, we're not able to see it clearly, unfortunately. But uh, that's Bangalore. 
So that's bad news. Uh, apparently, large network and a tight, separately connected uh, component. So which does mean that you get one person who is batch on that at least on GitHub they'll be following some other person and you should be able to connect mm -hmm. easily to them. And even if you're not part of the centrally connected component, there are enough reasonably sized clusters uh, all over the place. These are <coughs> clusters that so uh, sometimes focused, the color it incidentally indicates the language that they program in. So they may be language specific communities, they may be organization specific communities. But whatever. And then once you know this, you can also see how okay, this cluster, if you connect to this cluster, there's probably going to be some good that comes out of it. Uh, that's Chennai, the second largest community, and there is a community there. It turns out that I had missed them, but they're far smaller, and it's an emerging community. There's a group called Chennai East that has now started you know, together, getting more popular. So that uh, is emerging. Now that's Pune, probably the third. Uh, it is the third biggest among the Indian cities. Not there is no centrally connected uh, component. There are a few hubs here and there. If you go to Hyderabad, there are no hubs, there are three or four clusters, all the ones that I could identify were in organization. <coughs> so these are startups and people there are on GitHub and trying to reach other. Same with Mumbai and Delhi, and most of the cities don't really have it in In contrast, we also did this with the few cities in the Middle East, uh, Sri Lanka, Singapore, and so on. And depending on which place you're looking at, the Middle East, for instance, does not have any. We found three people uh, in Dubai on GitHub. And uh, in contrast, Singapore has a massively rich network. This incidentally uh, explains my choice of location I will be setting in that. <laughs> but not all designs need to be that complicated. Here's a simple redesign that we did for the uh, AP central path for the electricity bill. Sometimes something as mundane as electricity bill can be visualized. It's really just the number that you want to see. How much do I need to pay? Let's make sure that that's common. And once you know that, uh, the next thing that you want to know is why I got this bill. So, what was my, what's my current rating? What was my previous rating? What's the difference? Therefore, this month's meter rating is so much. Now, therefore, how much do I have to pay? Well, last month, you should have paid so much. This month, you need to pay so much. That's what's the in my book. And also, sometimes, just tell me how much did I use last month? How much did I use the month before that? How much did I use the same month last year? Because there's a huge seasonal variation in the months in which I switch on the air conditioning. Uh, is, that's going to make a big difference uh, to the amount of uh, power that I'm drawing. Also, tell me how I'm doing with respect to my neighbors, people nearby. Uh, are they drawing more power than me? Am I in the top 5% of the energy users? Am I in the bottom 5%? You know, let me, if I'm in the bottom 5%, let me show it to my neighbors and say, look, only <coughs> points or green points, whatever. Things like that can be put into an electricity bill, and it's reasonably simple to do it. This doesn't really call much for visualization as much as just presenting information. And if you were to take, uh, uh, this is another very simple visualization originally uh, created by the New York Times to show when you should have invested in stocks. So there was an original visualization, this one, tells you if you had bought and sold Reliance, if you had bought Reliance in anywhere from 2008, uh, sorry, 2006, 7, 8, 9, or 10, and had sold Reliance in this period, how much money would you have made uh, in relation to so the reds are where you have made a loss, the greens are where you have made a profit, the whites are where it's somewhere between. And the diagonals show a holding pattern. Well, firstly, <clears throat> one thing it tells you is, if you had ever bought in this period, you would have lost money. At best, you would have bought for uh, recovering your initial investment. If you had bought around this time and sold, so if you had bought around this time and <coughs> sold fairly early, you would have recovered a decent bit of your money. But if you had sold any later than that, well, at least you would have made a loss. But also, you can see the holding pattern. So if you're held for one year versus held for two years, held for three years, and so on. What kind of profit do I make in this industry? So one thing that we found consistently across stocks is holding periods of four years and, and more. So I mean, uh, systematic investment model is great. The data for the last uh, 10 years doesn't seem to indicate uh, that much on the stock markets. So let me end with Four books, which you can't read again, <laughs> but it's easy enough to remember them. Mm. Uh, just pick up any book by Edward Taft. These are all books by Edward Taft, and you'll get a sense of what visualizations can be. Like I said, I have not spoken about how you can create these visualizations. I will emphasize though that half of these visualizations can be created on Excel. You just need a sense of what can be done, and you need a sense of the story that you can build around it. And uh, <coughs>
<laughs> tell a picture story. So let me end. Uh, I will be taking questions for I guess five minutes. Uh, and uh, uh, just a plug about grammar. We are a data visualization company. We take large scale data, we analyze it in a non traditional way, and we tell picture stories out of that. You can find more about us on our website, grammar.com, and more about me on our website, as help the money. Take questions. questions. The first one uh, has to do with uh, clearly there, there had to be, I mean, the, the design that is shown on the front end. Uh, it's what is also the kind of, I mean, how does the technology make it possible for you to display something? And, I mean, so basically I just want to understand uh, this dynamic between uh, design and technology and therefore what makes it possible for you to show something in a certain way. Uh, so that's my first question. The second question is sort of uh, still something I'm uh, trying to, to arrive at in my own mind, but also um, in terms of, uh, I, I mean, I don't know if it's, it's as simple as how do you choose what is the problem out here? So also how do you determine patterns? And so where, I mean, so this, this question about uh, uh, this whole process of how do you read the pattern? Are you starting with a particular question or, or how is it, or is the problem that's posed to you? So the first question was the interplay between design and the technology. Design is something that unfortunately comes only to <coughs> practice. There are a few guidelines that one can pick up, but unfortunately, even applying those guidelines does take a lot of hard practice. The good part for it is technology helps, and there are an increasing number of visualizations that one can create quite easily. Uh, and in many cases, the technology itself drives the design. So if it's possible to easily create a green map, create a green map. It's extremely difficult to create while it's only for the uh, security visualization, which is called a cluster plot. Uh, so, to the extent design is driven by what you can do, and therefore, the tip might simply be to keep on the lookout for what are the tools that can create the visualization. Mm -hmm. Easiest way is an event like this. Uh, almost easy, as easy a way is to reach out to people who are talking about this technology and say, I want to represent something like this, just get me help. And what is the people that will do it? The other part, there are applications like, for instance, Tableau or probably Spotify, which do a very good job. Excel 2010, I'm 100% sure, has at least one chart that you have not used. Without it, no matter who you are, no matter how many centuries of Excel, day, Excel experience you have, you have not, you, there is at least one chart that you have not used. So, uh, <laughs> the quick answer, therefore, to design those technologies, design is to experience technologies and things that are quite often just going to be really cool. The second question was, uh, the patterns and patterns. Patterns. how do you know what pattern is? The part of it is, of course, uh, the experience. But uh, one, there are two ways of going around this. One, ask the question, try to find the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, in which case, you're well off. You know the domain. You know what kind of analysis that needs to be done. What you may be lacking is the ability to do that analysis, which can be easy. The tougher part is if you don't know the domain, don't know what to ask, and you just want to know what's interesting. What I found is one simple rule of thumb is. The data can be divided into two, you know, any data set that you can take can be uh, taken as an Excel sheet. Take an Excel. It'll have a bunch of columns and a bunch of rows. The columns will typically be of two types. Categorical variables, variables that, uh, numerical uh, metrics or numerical variables, which will have numbers in them, decimals by order. And categorical variables, which are categories, they'll typically be text. So let's assume you split the columns into, these columns have text, these columns have numbers. Now, Take any one of those numbers that you're interested in and find out how it varies by the client. For example, we're working with uh, a poultry company, trying to see what the uh, variation in mortality is for the chicks. So one simple automated way of detecting this is to say, what are the roof types? There are three types of roofs, as the stores tied and patched. For each roof type, what is the average mortality? Is there a significant difference? For each floor type, is there a, what is the average mortality? Is there a difference? So for every single, simple, every single categorical variable, find out what the average is of the metric. Now, this is a simple technique. It is just saying, find the average of each of the segments. But about 80% of the analysis that I've seen in all my life comprises sim of just this one thing. Tell me how a particular variable varies based on a set of techniques. The remaining 20%, it's okay, you can, you know, there you probably can go to the domain. But the good part is, this is something that can be done blindly without recording much experience. Yeah. Um, 
Hi, I'm Lina, and let me first congratulate you on a fantastic presentation. Uh, what I wanted to point out was this is danger of correlations, making correlations between uh, various variables and then making a, a broad generalization out of it. And uh, especially the birthday incidents kind of uh, made me a little worry. How do you protect yourself from making, I mean, how do you, how do you, yeah, how do you protect yourself from making such generalizations? What are, uh, what are the processes you follow within your team to, to make sure you're not falling into that fallacy? Uh, Eric Raymond had given the answer to that one. Okay. Because many eyes may count as shallow. Okay. You just open up the raw data, you can see find something different than us. And it doesn't necessarily sit on this process either. We create something, we share something. Two months later, we find out that it's wrong. We have found out in such cases. But the access to the raw data makes that possible. So let's try and make sure that it's raw data, make it publicly accessible. The raw data is done the access. Okay. 